ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد still discussing the affair of the ahkam of ramadan and those affairs related to the fiqh and the regulations of this virtuous month that is about to come upon us inshallah and in that regard we are taking from the book bulugh al maram min adillat al ahkam by al hafiz ibn hajar rahim al hafiz ibn hajar rahimahullah ta'ala who died in the year 852 after the hijra rahimahullah ta'ala the explanation of course of sheikh al-fawzan hafizahullah and we reached hadith number in volume 3 of the work of sheikh al-fawzan hafizahullah ta'ala tashil al-ilmam uh, and in the english the, the hadith number that, that i'm working with here is hadith number 663 if you are following me in the English translation published by Darus Salam, then it is hadith number 538 that we reached, insha'Allah. The hadith that came before that was the hadith pertaining to al-wisal, continual fasting, and the regulations regarding that. So today the hadith is from the same narrator, who is Abu Huraira. He mentions, وعنه, this is Al Hafid ibn Hajar, وعنه, قال, قال الله الله وسلم, meaning from Abu Huraira, who said that Allah's Messenger الله وسلم, said, Man lam yada' qawla zuri wal amala bihi wal jahla falaysa lillahi hajatun fi an yada' ta'amahu wa sharabahu rawahu al Bukhari wa Abu Dawud wa lafdu lahu. The hadith wherein the Prophet ﷺ said that whosoever does not leave off falsehood and acting in accordance with it and with ignorance, then Allah has no need that he should abandon his food and his drink. The hadith collected by Imam al-Bukhari and also by Abu Dawud and the wording is Abu Dawud's Rahim, Rahimahumullah. Shaykh al-Fawzan, hafizahullah ta'ala, he explains this hadith by mentioning that after mentioning the hadith regarding fasting, meaning siyam and fasting itself, Ibn Hajr now mentions the hadith regarding those affairs that violate the fast. And the violation of the fast is of two types. The first of them, is breaking it. The first of them is breaking in terms of its meaning. That is not food and non-drink, meaning it is the uh, breaking that is ma'nawi, that is ma'nawiyya, that you break the fast or that you violate the fast rather, better word, that you violate the fast in terms of its meaning that is not necessarily and it is not related to food and drink. In this situation, the fast is still valid, but its reward is reduced, or the reward is lost altogether. So these are the haram statements, and the haram looking, and everything that Allah has made haram. In this situation, the person does not have to make qada, he does not have to make up the fast, 
because he's fasting it is sahih it is sound but it is deficient it is reduced in terms of its reward so this hadith mentions what the fasting person must stay away from must stay away from naam and this is what the hadith mentions that whomsoever does not leave off falsehood and act in accordance with it and ignorance meaning ignorant foolishness then allah has no need that he should abandon his food and drink the term that is mentioned in the hadith where uh, the term that we translated as false falsehood or false speech then this is what is referred to in the arabic language as qawlu zur qawlu zur na qawlu zur or false speech or the speech of falsehood includes all haram speech such as cursing or to uh, to use abusive language or ghiba backbiting or namima which is scandal mongering and rumor mongering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the quran tazawaru an kahfihim dhat al yamin the meaning of which is turning away to the right from their cave when the sun rose referring to those people of the cave that they were turning away tazawaru meaning that so so the so so what is intended here tazawaru is to lean or to incline or to deviate away and this is to lean and incline in this regard the sun leans and inclines away from the people who were in the cave tazawaru so the term actually zur comes from this and what is intended here is inhiraf or to turn away and to deviate away and that's why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in surah al-hajj ayah number 30 wajtanibu qawl az-zur and leave off false speech qawl az-zur meaning the speech that is that 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 is turned away or yeah it is it is deviated or false speech and likewise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned wal ladina la yashhadun az-zur that those who do not uh, witness or bear witness to falsehood meaning that they do not attend the festivals of meaning uh, when allah mentions here in surah al-furqan ayah number 82 or 72 rather that those who do not bear witness to zur that those who do not witness az zur meaning those who do not attend the festivals of the unbelievers because in the festivals of the unbelievers there is zur and there is falsehood there is batil meaning that there is that which is falsehood and futile so this is what is intended by the statement of allah wal ladina la yashhadun az zur that those who do not witness az zur meaning that they do not attend the festivals of the unbelievers so every naam so every f- forbidden act from speech or act then it is considered and it is termed as zur it is termed as being zur meaning falsehood and zur can occur by way of speech as as occurs at is as it is mentioned this hadith qawlu zur meaning speech that is false wa qad yakun bil fa'l and it can also be zur can also me, be in terms of action also be in terms of action so one must not aban- so so one must abandon falsehood in speech and action so qawlu zur meaning false speech and in terms of action that one must abandon the acts that are zur also meaning that they are false acts that are deviated away from their obedience to allah and if one curses or abuses you then you must not rep- respond if you are fasting if it is if you are fasting you must not respond to the one who abuses you rather that a person should say that like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to say and used to command the people to say 
that he should say in Nisa'im, that indeed I am fasting. As occurs in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet Sallallahu said that if one is abused or one come, or someone comes to fight him, let him say, Inni sa'im. He should say, Indeed I am fasting. So he shouldn't respond by fighting back, nor should he respond by abusing or swearing. As this hadith mentions in Bukhari and Muslim, that if one is abused or someone comes to fight him, let him say, Inni sa'im. So fasting has an effect, my brothers and sisters, upon the outward behavior of a believer, of a Muslim. That a person, that even if, a, even if someone was to approach him, that he is so protective over this, over this act of worship, that he does not want the reward to be diminished in any form. So whilst he is fasting, he says that he, you know, as, as they say, he bites his tongue. He does not respond that he values this fast, this act of obedience so greatly. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the hadith Qudsi that indeed I shall give reward for it because he left off his food and his drink and his desires for me. So therefore I will recompense him. So the act of fasting is something, my brothers and sisters, that we do not sell, that we do not allow uh, someone to come and ruin it for us because sometimes a person that he is tested Himself, he is tested and he is tried. And because of his test and trial, that he draws you into his fitna, and into his tribulation, his trial, and his mehna. So a person does not respond to it, barakallahu feekum. That you remain steadfast. And as Shaykh al-Fawzan mentions, that he says, I am fasting. He tells the person, indeed I am fasting. Meaning, I'm not going to argue with you. And I'm not going to abuse you back. And I'm not going to fight against you. For indeed, I am fasting. And he does not respond to him. وَالْعَمَلُوا بِهِ And like the Prophet ﷺ said, that, the, that a person who does not leave off uh, false speech and acting in accordance to it, and acting in accordance to it, this means to do haram things, such as hitting someone, or killing someone, or transgressing against the people by being unjust, and uh, transgressing against the people in terms of your actions. So in the month of Ramadan, or in, rather in any month, in all of the days of the year, and throughout the whole of your life, we don't, we're not supposed to transgress against anyone. Even if someone transgresses against us, then we do not transgress against them. And if we realize that we have transgressed, transgressed or that we have, we have done something that we shouldn't do, then we withhold, barakallahu feekum, we withhold, and we stop ourselves as soon as we are reminded. Wal jahl. And as he mentioned, Shaykh al Fawzan, that when Allah's Messenger وسلم, said that whomsoever does not leave off falsehood in speech or false speech and acting in accordance to it and ignorance, then the ignorance here, wal jahl, then this is to be foolish and vulgar. And it is the opposite of al hilm. It is the opposite of being patient and forbearing. So the fasting person does not behave in a vulgar, r- foolish, and ignorant manner. Rather, he should be dignified, and he should be forbearing and patient. And the intent of jahl, then it is, as the Sheikh has mentioned, a safah, which means that it is the jahl here, it is referring to being obscene and being vulgar. And the absence of being kind. So it is to be brash, to be harsh, to be obscene, to be vulgar. So if a person, a person should avoid that in the month of Ramadan. He should avoid that throughout his life. But more so when he is fasting. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran. إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى اللَّهِ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ يَعْمَلُونَ السُّوءَ بِجَهَالَةٍ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 17, Allah only accepts the repentance of those who do evil in foolish ignorance. So Shaykh Al-Fawzan, he mentions, Naam, the Sheikh Al Fawzan thereafter he mentions so the intent here of Jahl in this ayah 
is not the absence of knowledge. When Allah mentions, يَعْمَلُونَ السُّوءَ بِجَهَالَةٍ that the intent here of jahala or ignorance of jahal is not the absence of knowledge, rather uh, that, uh, naam, that as, as, as the ayah mentions, that those who do evil in foolishness. But the so, so it is not that a person is taken to account because of him not knowing, rather the intent here is his foolishness, and this foolishness that it harms and it violates his fast. So it is not befitting that a fasting person behaves foolishly with the sufaha, with the foolish ones. Rather, he leaves off foolish behavior and vulgar behavior and so on. As for his saying, I mean the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لِلَّهِ هَاجَ that Allah is not in need. It is said that its meaning is that Allah does not want his siyam. Allah doesn't want it. Allah does not wish for it because Allah wants the good and sound and correct fasting that is free and devoid from that which damages it and destroys it. So Allah is not pleased with it. So Allah is not in need of his, of his ibadah. And his deeds, because his fast is not correct. His fast is not correct. So this hadith proves that fasting is not merely that you abandon food and drink. Rather, this, that this fast must be accompanied by leaving off haram deeds. And leaving off, uh, the leaving off of food and drink is to leave off of that which is normally permitted. Because... Food and drink is something that is normally permitted. But leaving off falsehood in speech and action and vulgar and rude behavior is to leave off what is ordinarily forbidden anyway. And this is wajib upon a Muslim always and at all times, whether he is fasting or not fasting. And whilst fasting, it is more of an, of an obligation to leave off that which is norm, ordinarily haram. So you can see that a Muslim throughout the whole of his life, that he should be careful. He should be careful of not lying, not deceiving, not speaking in falsehood, not cursing, not falling into argumentation. And, you know, having those, having those harsh and hard feelings towards other believers. He shouldn't have that anyway. He shouldn't be butt-biting anyway. He shouldn't be uh, entering into uh, false rumors and rumor-mongering and tail-carrying. This is the normal behavior of a Muslim. That he shouldn't be a foolish person acting foolishly all the time and being vulgar and obscene in his speech. So when the, when the month of Ramadan comes, so imagine if a person now in the month of Ramadan that throughout the normal days of his life, that he's a person who is rude, ill-mannered. That he's not, he doesn't have any hilm. He's not kind and forbearing. He's rather vulgar, obscene, abrupt, rude, nasty, foolish, always cursing the people, always picking fights with the people, maybe even hitting, you know, any, any time an argument comes, then he's the first one to go and fling a punch. Then the month of Ramadan comes. So the only difference that this person has made in his life, he stopped eating. That's the only thing he's done. So now in the month of Ramadan comes, he continues with that evil behavior. And the only thing that he has changed in his life that he stopped eating and stopped drinking. Bas. So what need does Allah have of this person? How has he benefited himself just by starving himself? So the only thing he gets out of the, out of the fasting day is what? Hunger and thirst. And he misses his wife. Bas. That's the only thing. So what has he, how has he benefited with the month of Ramadan coming upon him? So a person... And, and, you know, it is, it is something that is shocking. That this month of Ramadan, as we'll come to know as, as the, 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 these classes go on, the month of Ramadan, the month in which on the first night of the month of Ramadan, that the gates of Jannah are opened and not a single one is left closed. The gates of hellfire are closed shut and not a single one is left open. And the shayateen, 
And some of the scholars, they mention what is intended by the shayateen. Is it the effect of the shayateen? Is it that all of them are, sh- all of them are chained up? But well, nevertheless, the Prophet Sallallahu said, and the shayateen, they are chained up, meaning that they are restrained and chained. Yet in the month of Ramadan, you see that, especially with, with the teenagers, that you find that they're more mischievous in the, in the West than they are outside the month of Ramadan. We get more complaints from the neighbors of the, Mus- of the masajid of the Muslimin that the neighbors, they say, you know, that the, that the youth are making noises in the street and they are fighting each other and they are banging on the doors and, and the cars are getting broken into and the police have to put extra uh, uh, officers on the beat because of the fact that the Muslim youth are out of control in the month of Ramadan. So what do they gain? When I say youth... I'm not talking about six and seven year olds. We're talking about men in reality. That they are from the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated fasting upon them. These are grown men. But they are young in age. Yani they are maybe 16, 17 or 18. But Allah has obligated upon them the fast. Allah has obligated upon them the, the regulations of the sharia. Yet in the month of Ramadan, you find them behaving in an obscene, vulgar manner, fighting each other, breaking into cars, uh, smashing windows, such that the police have to issue in many of the countries where the, uh, where the majority, you know, the non-Muslim countries and so on, that the police have to issue letters to the masajid. Please can you make sure that you are encouraging your youth to stay in the masjid during the tarawih prayer, during the night prayer. Because we have found that the complaints increase and that we have to send out more police out onto the streets to, to control the youth. So, what need does Allah have? Allah is free anyway, al ghani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from, from need and self-sufficient of any, of, uh, and self-sufficient and free of the needs of anybody. But the point is here that in the month of Ramadan, when we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we need His forgiveness, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up the opportunity for each and every person in this month to benefit and to gain from this month, so much so that the Prophet ﷺ said that whomsoever stands in the night of the month of Ramadan, in the night, with Iman, hoping in the reward for Allah, then Allah will forgive his previous sins. This is the month of Ramadan. So we have to be wary of what we are exactly gaining in the month of Ramadan. And what is worse than even that is that you find certain Muslims, they will fast during the day, but they won't pray. Then what's the purpose of your fast? You withhold from food and drink, but you don't make ibadah of Allah. They don't pray dhuhr, they don't pray asr. Even some of the parents, they send their children to schools, state schools and so on, which is another topic on its own, but they send their children to state schools and so on. And they don't encourage their children to go and to pray. When the time of dhuhr comes, their children don't pray. Jum'ah comes and their children aren't praying Jum'ah. And these children are, it is obligatory upon them to pray. Once they have reached the age of puberty. But parents, even in the month of Ramadan, that they don't encourage their children with Jum'ah, and with Jama'ah, and with the Salah, and with other than that from the affairs of Ibadah. Even in the month of Ramadan, they won't encourage them. Even in the month of Ramadan, you see how many of grown men, adults, reach the age of puberty and beyond puberty. Grown men. That you see them, even during the month of Ramadan, that they start shaving their beards. Major sin. Or that they allow their garments to fall below their ankles for men. Major sin. Or sisters who don't wear the hijab, and they don't wear the khimar, and they don't wear the jilbab when they leave their homes. Major sin. Or that even they continue. And these are sinful things outside the month of Ramadan. But here the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned it specifically in the, for the fasting person. That Allah is not in need. Of him giving up his food and his drink. Yet he doesn't give up false speech. He doesn't give up acting upon falsehood. Meaning doing that which is haram. He doesn't give it up. So he continues and the only thing that he does. Stops eating and drinking. And then he expects reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How much reward does he expect? That he just gives up food and drink. That does not mean. That now he says, well, I'm a sinful person, so what's the point of fasting? Because by him not fasting, he just increased more sin upon sin. Do you see the point here? That a person, 
that what is not upon him is to say, okay, the you know the the the, the brother said in the dars that the that Allah is the, the the person who does not give up false speech and acting upon falsehood and acting foolishly, then Allah is not in need of him giving up his food and drink. So therefore, I find it hard to give up false speech. I can't stop lying. I can't stop swearing. I can't stop cursing. I can't stop. I can't stop backbiting. And I do haram. I listen to music, and I do this, and I do that, and I, you know, I, or the sister she doesn't wear the hijab, or the man he keeps shaving his beard. So he says to himself, "So Allah is not in need of my fast, so I'm not going to fast either." What's he done by doing so? He's just increased his sin, right? Because before, okay, he was listening to music, and he was backbiting, and he was lying. And he was musbil, allowing his garments to fall below his ankles. Or for the woman, she doesn't wear the khimar or the, or the jilbab. Or that he shaves his beard. So these are all the sins that he commits. Then on top of that, he stops fasting as well. Because this is the deception of shaitan, right? Because shaitan, all he wants you to do is that when you start committing sin, he wants you to commit more and more and more sin up until that person leaves Islam altogether. Because that's the goal of shaitan. So the intent of these ahadith is not that a person gives up his fasting and says, well, I'm a sinful person, so what's the point of fasting? No. That the point of this, of these types of hadith, is to encourage him to say, you know what? I'm going to try my best to stop. In fact, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to listen to music anymore. And if, she, if it's a sister, I'm going to wear the hijab. And I'm going to wear the jilbab. And I'm not going to wear makeup when I leave the home. And I'm not going to perfume myself when leaving the home. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said that any woman who leaves her house while she is perfumed and she walks amongst the men or walks amongst the marketplaces amongst the men, then she has resembled a fornicating woman. So I'm not going to wear perfume. So it encourages her. That's why the month of Ramadan for many people, just like Umrah, just like Hajj, how many people you see entering the month of Ramadan by the time they finish Ramadan, their whole life has changed. And they change their whole attitude towards their life. After that, you find them being the best of people, the most righteous of people. The man who entered the month of Ramadan. And he used to shave his beard. By the time he finishes Ramadan, he doesn't touch the beard ever again till the day that he dies. Or the man who enters the month of Ramadan. And he says, I'm going to stop listening to music. How can I fast the month? of? I'm, I'm, I'm giving up my food, giving up my drink. I'm giving up relationship with my wife. And I'm praying in the night. I'm praying the five daily prayers. How can I be listening to music between Dhuhr and Asr? And then listen to music again between Asr and Maghrib. How can I do that? So he stops. By Ramadan finish, Eid comes. After Eid, he never listens to music till the day that he dies. Never listens to it again. So Ramadan becomes a springboard for a person to start acting in a righteous manner, behaving correctly benefiting himself, fixing his manners, if he had some harshness with him, that he's a rude, obnoxious person with crude and abrupt behavior towards other Muslims and towards other believers, then he rectifies that in the month of Ramadan. And he comes out of Ramadan and the people say, this man changed, look. Because that's the effect Ramadan is supposed to have. When we make hajj with the brothers, some, a person will come and hajj because sometimes you find, and I've had this discussion with brothers in the past, that you find that, that you find many of the people of sin, that they, that they gather their money together to perform hajj. They're sinful. You see them, they come to the airport, Heathrow Airport, to Manchester Airport, and they reach the airport, and they have no beard, that they have no beard, they've been shaving. Most people maybe still got their earphones in their ears where they're listening to the music. When they enter into hajj, the whole of the Hajj period for them is an act of ibadah because they want to purify themselves from the sin. And if they end up in the company of good people who teach them sunnah, teach them salafiyyah, teach them how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly, the aqidah, the effect of the aqidah upon the heart and the effect of the aqidah upon the limbs, they return back completely different because that's the effect that these monumental acts of worship have upon the soul and upon the, upon the heart of that person. This is the purpose. You know, when you look at these mawasim and these periods that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to a person throughout his life, throughout the year, that they are opportunities. And this is why we say 
Yes, you, a person may enter the month of Ramadan very sinful. Maybe even fornicating. Has a girlfriend. Waliyadu billah. He has this major sin, you know, that is, that is hanging off, off, off him like a weight upon his neck. That if he was to die, then he is deserving of the punishment of Allah in the barzakh and in the akhirah. But Allah gives him enough life that he enters the month of Ramadan and he says, how can I fornicate and I'm fasting? How can I have a girlfriend? How can I be touching her? How can I be doing all the other things that, 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 that the people they do? How can I be doing and I'm fasting? So he says, no way. I'm not going to do it. Not month of Ramadan. So maybe in the back of his mind he has this thing after the month of Ramadan. But because he's sincere in the month of Ramadan, seeking Allah's forgiveness, that the, that the month, this month of Ramadan and his fasting overtakes him to such a degree that by about halfway the month of Ramadan he says, I don't want to see this woman again. Or the woman says, I don't want to see that man again. Khalas, done. How can after this month of Quran that I've been reading, maybe he made i'tikaf in the last 10 days, how am I going to return back to that life? You find people like this. That this is these are this is what you find many in mean, many of the khutb of the ulama like Sheikh Sheikh Al Fawzan Sheikh Ibn Thaymin, rahimahullah, that they that they always mention. Look how Allah gives opportunity after opportunity that a person can springboard himself into a better lifestyle, into a better person, morally better, in his ibadah better, in his understanding of the religion better, in his seeking of knowledge better. He becomes a better husband. He becomes a better father. He becomes a better son to his mother and father. He becomes a better brother to the rest of the Muslims. This is the beauty of these types of opportunities. Barakallahu feekum. The next hadith, hadith number 664, which is 539 with yourselves. And that, that is the hadith of Aisha radiyallahu anha qalat kana rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam yuqabbilu wa huwa sa'im that she said radiyallahu anha that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to kiss meaning his wives and he was fasting wa yubashiru wa huwa sa'im and he would touch them and he was fasting walakinnahu amlakukum However, he was the one who had the most control from amongst you over his sexual desires. Muttafaqun alayhi, the hadith reported by Bukhari and Muslim, and the wording is Muslim, is of Imam Muslim. Wazada fi riwayatin fi Ramadan. And there's an increase in one of the wordings that says that he used to kiss. His wives whilst he was fasting and touched them whilst he was fasting in the month of Ramadan. Shaykh al Fawzan mentions that this shows that the Prophet wasallam would take pleasure, that he would take pleasure and touch his wives whilst he was fasting. And the term here, yubashir, meaning this, this term mubashara, is to touch the skin directly without a barrier. Kana yubashiru, meaning that he used to touch them, meaning that he would touch his wives directly, skin to skin, without a barrier. And he would kiss his wives whilst he was fasting. However, at the end of the hadith, Aisha radiallahu anha pointed out, or pointed to the fact, that he was more capable than others in controlling his sexual desires. So this proves the permissibility for the fasting person to touch, to touch his wife in the flesh and to kiss her as long as it does not lead him to fulfill his sexual desires. In which case, if a person fears that for himself, then he should distance himself from even touching or kissing because that would lead to a path of evil. Naam. And then he mentions... That some of the fuqaha, or some of the jurists, the scholars, hold that it was allowed for the older man to touch his wife and disallowed for the younger one to touch his wife. Because the youth 
has stronger urges and desires to fulfill them. <clears throat> Even though the Sheikh doesn't mention this hadith, but I'll mention it to you. The hadith is Hassan and recorded by Imam Ahmed in his Musnad, where it is mentioned that Abdullah ibn Amr, Naam, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, radiyallahu anhuma, he said that we were with the Messenger of Allah when a youth came and he said, may I kiss my wife whilst fasting? The Prophet sallallahu said, no. Then an old man came and he said, may I kiss, may I kiss my wife whilst I'm fasting? And the Prophet sallallahu said, yes. So Abdullah ibn Amr, he said, so we started looking at, looking at, each, at each other. So Allah's Messenger sallallahu said, the old man is able to control himself. So, Sheikh Al-Fawzan mentioned, so it, is, so it is not allowed in every case without restriction to touch and kiss one's wife. This restriction mentioned by Aisha Ummul Mu'mineen must be adhered to. That there is a difference between one who is not stirred by his desires and the one who is stirred by his desires. So this is the issue of touching and approaching one's wife in the month of Ramadan. And you can see the difference between the two. If one is able to control himself, then la shak, it is allowed for him and his fast is not broken for him to kiss and to touch his wife. There is a, another issue that is related to this. And uh, maybe inshallah if I get time, not, not today, but maybe on another occasion, we'll read so much, some of the speech of Sheikh Al-Albani rahimahullah regarding the one who approaches his wife and he, uh, he, he fondles her and he courts her uh, without actually having sexual relations with her and what is the ruling upon that. And then, the, then there's some difference of opinion amongst the scholars in that affair now. No, the, the, the Jumhur or the, or the vast majority of the scholars, they hold that a man, as long as, whether he be young or old, he is allowed to touch and to kiss his wife because the, the ultimate condition here being what? That he's not stirred by his desires. So long as he can control his desires, it is allowed. It is allowed. If he is younger, the point here being, if he is younger, then it is more likely that he will not be able to control himself. And if he is older, then it is more likely that he will control himself. So it is, it is the likelihood. What is the likelihood of an older person? The older person can control his desires better. And there occurs in a hadith of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with regard to the severity of Allah's punishment on Yawm al-Qiyamah for three people. The first is the, is the Sheikh, a Sheikh Uzani, or the Sheikh who is a fornicator, meaning an old man who fornicates. He is severely punished on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Why? Because the older man is not expected to fornicate. You know, he's a man who's married with children, maybe grandchildren. So who is more prone to the, to the desires of women? The younger men as opposed to the older men. So the older man who fornicates, the older man who fornicates, then he has a severe punishment on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Even though the younger one will be punished, but the older one will be punished more, more severely. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the second person, and that is the, the ruler who lies. He's the king of a country, Malikun Kadhab, the king who is a liar. Because a king is not expected to lie. He has power, he has strength, he controls his nation. Why, why lie? What is he afraid of that he needs to lie? And the third one is the poor person who is arrogant and haughty. What's he got to be arrogant about? You're poor. Upon you is to be humble. You know, you have nothing to be arrogant about. It is expected more from a rich person that is arrogant. Because he's deceived by his wealth. He's deceived by his property. He's, he's deceived by his rank in society. So he's, he, has, he is more prone to being arrogant, even though it's forbidden for him. 
But for a poor person who's miskeen, faqeer, for what reason does he have to be arrogant and haughty and have kibber? An old man, for what reason should he fornicate? His days of that, of that youthful desire, of the heat of youth, that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ma'ashir al-shabaab, O youth, those of you who are able to marry, then get married. Because the youth, he has a greater propensity towards transgressing when it comes to, to women folk. But an old man, he shouldn't. Rather, the old man restrains the young one. He says, no, no, don't do that. The old man restrains himself. And this hadith is a proof of that. The hadith, where an old man came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, am I allowed to kiss my wife and I'm fasting? He said, yes. Why? Because the old man, he can restrain himself. When the young man came, he said, Ya Rasulullah, can I kiss my wife and I'm, and, and I'm fasting? He said, no, not you. Why? Because the young one finds it hard to control himself. He may go further and break his fast. Right? So there's a difference between the two. But it is possible also that a young man, sometimes because of his maturity, that he's able to kiss his wife and restrain himself and not break his fast. So he just kisses her, maybe touches her. Beyond that, he doesn't you know, break his fast by uh, having sexual relations with her. Barakallahu feekum. So bear that in mind. When are you going to call the other one? A couple of minutes. So inshallah we'll finish upon that. Because the ne- uh, in, uh, Sheikh Al-Fawzan gathers the next three hadith all together. And that covers three pages. So inshallah, or four pages. So inshallah we'll conclude there for today. Barakallahu feekum. Wa jazakumullahu khairan for your patience.